I went to southern France as a travel guide at the beginning of November 2023, staying at a hotel in Nice for the five nights. Working as a travel guide can be both fun and exhausting. Soon after we checked in at our hotel, after boarding our first flight in Denmark at 7 a.m. and changing flights in Frankfurt, I headed to the train station to buy tickets to Antibes for the following day. I was tired after only three hours of sleep, but also excited to be back in Nice and went exploring a little. That first few hours after you've just arrived in a new place always feels special. You're slightly amazed that this other place has existed all this time, if you've never been there before. Or if you have been there before, there's that sense of recognition, yet still a palpable sense of newness. You were in your own place, your own country, only hours before. Our hotel was a 20-minute walk, or a two-minute tram ride, away from the Place Masséna, the central square in Nice. It's characterized by a chessboard pavement and sienna-colored buildings all the way around, and lies between the pedestrian zone with the shops and the Mediterranean. I headed for the sea that first afternoon, and the iconic Promenade des Anglais, remembering to stop at a beautiful building with trompe l'oeil windows on the way, that is, windows that are painted on and not real. The Promenade des Anglais is a seven kilometer long boardwalk created in the 1800s when many members of the English aristocracy fled to Nice every winter. Some hotel names still bear witness to this. The first time I went to Nice with my family, we stayed at the Hotel Westminster. Despite being tired, I enjoyed walking around Nice as the sun began to set. It's my preferred way of exploring any place. Just walking around, going down random streets, taking in the architecture, the people, the sounds, the language. I found some quiet streets and wandered back to our hotel, feeling strangely jet-lagged, despite no time difference between France and Denmark. I had a simple meal and spent the evening looking over a map and planning a city walk the following day, a typical evening for a travel guide. The next morning we took the train to Antibes, where I was to give the guests a little tour of the town. We walked on the old city wall, dating back to the 16th and 17th centuries, and gawked at some of the outlandishly huge yachts. Antibes has the biggest marina in Europe and caters to both luxurious yachts and small fishing boats and everything in between. The weather did not behave as we'd all hoped, it being southern France. But I had seen it on the weather forecast already from home, and a little rain never hurt anybody. We didn't get a little rain, but the guests took it in their stride. A stop at the Marché Provençal kept us semi-dry for a little while, and the guests were amazed at all the fresh produce, flowers, cheese, lavender, and other typically French products. The French are so good at selling and buying things fresh every day in markets up and down the country, even though it takes much longer to set up and to go by every day. I gave the guests a few minutes to explore and went exploring myself a little to figure out where to take them next, given the weather. There were few people about, of course, as I wandered down some of the little alleyways and passages. I remembered how on previous visits I'd seen English pubs and English supermarkets and even an English bookstore, and thought to myself that this was not the kind of weather all the Anglophones or as Danes, for that matter, came for. But the lady at the train station the day before had told me the recent downpours were the first in nine months, so all the French appreciated it. When we met up again, we all agreed that we might as well head for the restaurant where we were to have lunch. They were all keen wine drinkers, and when I commended them for this, they said, well, we are in France, aren't we? 
After lunch, some of them took the train back to Nice. Others wanted to visit the Picasso Museum, and so I took them there and continued on with the small group. The museum is in an old castle, which Picasso stayed at for six months, and he left all the works he produced during that time to the museum. Several of the guests were avid art lovers and spent the rest of the day there as the rest of us walked on a bit. The rain stopped, for a while anyway, and I was glad that at least a few of them could see a little more of Antibes. Later, back in Nice, I had an early night, and the next day we were picked up by Sylvie in a bus to go to saint paul de vence I asked her if we could swing by the Promenade des Anglais because some of the guests hadn't managed to walk all the way down there the previous day. And so she somewhat grumblingly navigated the early morning traffic in downtown Nice. We passed by the Hotel Negresco, the most illustrious hotel on the Riviera, and all the white buildings and palm trees lining the promenade. We headed up into the mountains right above Nice and drove through a few small towns and villages. I confess to loving this part of France perhaps a little bit more than the Riviera itself. I love the quiet of the hills, all the trees, which by the way were still green and leafy, as several of the guests noted as well. Today you couldn't tell we were in the beginning of November. I alternately told the guests about Saint Paul de Vence and the museum and made conversation with Sylvie in tentative French. We spotted Saint Paul de Vence in the distance, but our first stop of the day was the Museum Fondation Meg, just outside town. It had been apparent from the artwork and all the roundabouts nearby that a renowned museum was nearby, the largest private collection in France. Sylvie dropped us off at the foot of the last hill and we climbed up to the museum. The museum was built in collaboration between the owner and a Spanish architect and some of the artists whose works adorned the walls and the gardens of the place from the very beginning, including Miro and Chagall. It's created to form part of the surrounding landscape and is inspired by both Miro's studio on Mallorca and by Gaudí's works in Parc Güell in Barcelona. Thankfully, the weather had markedly improved and we could enjoy the view and the outside of the museum as we were meant to. Some of the guests had come on this trip for the art alone, so I was relieved that the weather gave them a better experience today. The conversation among the guests often returned to art, and I wished I'd been more of a connoisseur to be able to tell them more about all the artworks, but it was my first time at the museum too. That's a constant concern as a travel guide, for me at least. It feels as if I've never done quite enough research. When everyone had gotten their fill of art, some sooner than others, I found a route on the map on my phone to take us to saint paul de vence that seemed to be a bit more scenic than just walking on the side of the road. Saint-Paul-de-Vence is a picturesque little town lying behind fortified walls from the late Middle Ages at the top of a hill. It used to be frequented by actors and artists, and now certainly also by tourists. There are some 70 art galleries in it, but I mainly enjoy the narrow cobbled streets and the beautiful old houses, the atmosphere of the place. 
Cars can't enter it, which I suspect is another reason for its charm. There's a tiny main square with a fountain. And right about then, I more or less voluntarily began eavesdropping on some French women who spoke rather loudly and who were walking the same way as me. And I thought to myself, not for the last time during that trip, that I would love to spend weeks in France, surrounded only by French people, to immerse myself in the language and become more fluent. There was art everywhere, and quaint, narrow alleyways everywhere. You can easily walk to the end of the main street and from there up on the outside wall. The view from the old battlements was wonderful and I found the little churchyard just outside the old walls. I eavesdropped on a few more French conversations, simply for the French of it, and went to the churchyard to see the grave of Marc Chagall. The guests had some time to themselves there, but I bumped into a few of them and we had lunch together. Afterwards, I took in the view once again, and now the sky was clear enough for us to see the snow-capped peaks of the Alps in the distance. On our way down to the bus, we passed some villagers who were playing petanque, and when we got back to Nice, I spent some quiet time knitting on my little balcony, relieved that the day had gone according to plan, and that the guests seemed happy. The buildings are beautiful here. Look at that building over there with the mint green shutters. And then all the trees, which are quite lovely, and the mountains in the background. I've just come back from Saint Paul de Vence, and there we could actually see the Alps in the distance, the snow covered peaks of the Alps. Then I went back outside to buy something to eat, strolled around a bit to savor the fact that it didn't rain, but also in need of recharging my batteries back in my hotel room. At this point, I was beginning to feel a bit of a sensory overload. Two weddings were underway when we arrived in the old town the following morning. It was the guests' day off, but I had offered to take anyone interested to the old part of Nice, Vieux Nice, and so we walked there shortly after breakfast. I didn't want them to feel they had to keep me company, and so left them at the flower market to explore the area at their own leisure. The area is distinctly different from other parts of Nice, and has sometimes been compared to Napoli that is, Naples. It's a labyrinth of narrow streets and alleyways, and many of the street signs have names in both French and Italian, stemming from the time Nice belonged to Italy. I walked back to the market, I hadn't wanted to film with the guests there that first time round, and marveled again at the liveliness of the French market. It really is a testimony to a slower way of living, Then I walked down to the Promenade des Anglais again, and the Mediterranean. The waves were magnificent, and it was difficult to fathom how, a few months previously, that sea would have been full of bathers. I had no destination in mind, no purpose other than to hang out in Nice. 
When you're constantly focused on the next thing to do for the guests, the next bus to confirm, the next tickets to buy or bill to pay, it almost felt strange having so much time on my hands. I knew, too, that I was lucky to be there with such a small group, only 16 guests, compared to 48 when I went to Paris in September. And I was also fortunate that they were all nice, easy to talk to, and inquisitive. Two of them were about my age, but the rest were what I might term seniors. Yet after a few days, I no longer thought of them that way. It was as if their ageless selves shone through somehow, which was interesting. I hung out by the sea for a long time, mesmerized by the sheer power of the waves. They sometimes rose to what I would guess to be about seven or eight meters in the air, some 25 feet. I walked down to the port where I saw more beautiful buildings and more luxury yachts. Nice is composed of so many neighborhoods that seem so different from one another, and I couldn't recall having walked this way before. After a while I didn't know where I was, until I checked the map on my phone and realized I had reached a central square from the other side the Place Garibaldi. From there I walked briefly back into the old part of Nice, then out along a narrow stretch of park, until I reached the Tête Carré again, or the square head. From there I headed up a hill into a residential area in search of the Matisse Museum. I hadn't gone last time but had chosen the Chagall Museum instead, and I probably should have chosen that again. As I walked into the Matisse Museum, I met two of the guests coming out. They were disappointed, they said, and thought there would be more. Twenty minutes later I was back outside and felt much the same. So if you ever find yourself in Nice, Go to the Chagall Museum, if you like Chagall, of course. Oh well, it's raining again. On our last day, we had hours to spend in Nice before our flight, which wasn't until 7 p.m. The weather was perfect, the warmest all week, and everyone agreed that we were lucky to get at least one day with perfect Mediterranean weather. That's the best way to travel, in my opinion, or to go about anything in life. Appreciate what we get when we like it and live with it when we don't. Or even better, try to learn to like all of it. That way you'll be a lot less disappointed and a lot more joyful. I went back down to the sea, determined to sit in one of the iconic blue chairs and knit for a bit. but most of them are right on the edge of the Promenade des Anglais and were being sprayed with salt water every few seconds. It was sunny, but windy. I guess I filmed the sea a lot that day, but it was truly awesome. The force of the waves the sun glittering in the azure blue water, and I was reminded that the Riviera is called the Côte d'Azur in French. I spent a good hour next to the sea, on a blue chair a little further away from the sea, where I settled down with my knitting. The waves were splashing up onto the promenade, in some places over it and onto the street beyond it. It seemed as if everyone was out enjoying a Sunday walk, and I took the opportunity to look at people. Another favorite pastime when I'm out traveling. I passed by the hotel I once stayed at, the Hotel Westminster, and began to feel some ice cream was in order, and so left the crowds and headed back up into Old Nice in search of ice cream. The guests I'd met at the museum the day before 
had walked up there, despite taking the tram whenever they could. But there was no tram up there, and so they walked. They did take a bus back down, they said. I said I could understand that, and well done for finding one. Another guest, I later learned, had also walked all the way up there and back. He was 87 years old. If I was to pass on anything that these guests embodied to me, and which no doubt was part of the reason why many of them appeared somehow ageless, it would be to stay curious, be kind, and drink wine. I finished my ice cream and found a quiet bench near some trees. And later I went in search of somewhere to have a meal before our flight. I wasn't the only solitary diner there. In fact, we were four in my little corner of the place. I had pita bread, guacamole and a coca-cola. My trip was coming to a close and I was thankful to have been there thankful to be going home. Adieu Nice et à bientôt.